many, many years ago, but for the last sort of seven years I've been working a lot with open access and open science. Um, so that's what I'm focusing on today, and part of the reason for being here today is, is to bring, look at bringing the two, the two worlds together, because I very much feel there is quite a lot of uh, division between these different conversations. Um, so, I mean, in terms of how we've managed to be in a room here today, obviously uh, the fact that we've got vaccines created so quickly, uh, the rules suddenly changed, didn't they? They were around um, how research was carried out. You know, publishers lowered their paywalls, uh, commercial companies uh, waived their patents, and researchers shared their data. So one of, that's why this is so important, that, that when you open um, up research, then you can um, solve, solve the problems. I think I'm preaching to the converted in, in this audience, um, really. So in terms of what, what I'm going to do today is just going to look at doing um, a project update because I was here two years ago talking about uh, the EOS Synergy project that I'll be talking about. I'm going to give you an update on what's happened since then. But also, um, from my perspective, more interesting to talk about the collaborations and, and the work, the people that I've worked with and the problems that we've worked on together um, to give a sort of story of collaboration for the last uh, two years. And hopefully you'll find that uh, useful and I very much would like uh, the perspectives of, of the open education community as well um, on, on the activities that we're talking about here. Um, as Mara mentioned, the slides and a, and a blog post are published because there's quite a lot of ground to cover. In fact, when I sat down and did a, a mind map of what I wanted to cover today, this is what it looked like. And now it looks really, really inadequate compared to that lovely graphical one that Brian showed earlier. But um, that there's, I've, I've come a long way, certainly personally, in terms of my knowledge and understanding of the open science world. Um, and so there's quite a lot to get across, but what I'm going to try and do is sort of give us a, a pathway through this, and as I say, give, give some stories of collaboration and of open in action. Um, but before we get um, into to the specifics, I do want to just do a bit of background um, on open science, uh, just in case that's not something that you're familiar with. This diagram here, you might start to see more and more. Um, this is showing the different aspects of open science. And you'll notice that um, OERs are actually seen as being part of that umbrella of open science. And one of the first issues that, that people usually have with open science is that, well, it's open science, I'm not a scientist. Why are you calling it that? It's, it's just about open research. The word science is obviously used quite commonly globally, um, and it comes from the, the, root, the Latin root of the word science to mean knowledge. So we are, unfortunately, as well, I think this definition on the slide here has come from UNESCO. The UNESCO Open Science recommendations were adopted last November, so you will start to see more of this, and it's just interpreted differently in different countries to be scholarship or open research. Um, the other key point is that it's not just about the outputs of research, it's about the whole process of research and opening that up, right from when you have an idea to when you share it, um, moving through uh, sharing your active data, sharing code, software, etc. Um, so, as I say, it's not just about focusing on the output. As we've seen in other sessions, the whole open practice, set of open practices underpinned by values and principles, and again, these come from the UNESCO recommendations, so we're talking about collective benefits, equity and fairness, um, very similar to the open um, education um, values. There was actually an awful lot of values and declarations and principles and manifestos in the open science world and hopefully they'll start to rationalise shortly. But one key um, one that I do want to focus on today or set of principles is FAIR, which is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. 
I'm not sure of the awareness of this acronym in the open educational community, but this is these are the this is the law we live by in the open science community. Um, so it, it, they're actually fair data principles. So it's about how making data um, findable, accessible, interoperable, and re reusable. So that's what that um, acronym actually means. And it was developed in 2016 uh, by a global um, working group by an organisation called Force 11. Uh, as I say, I've put all my links in, in my um, slides and, and blog. So we have this whole idea of opening up research, not just the, the outputs, but the whole process. Um, how, how is it happening? Well, there are, there are lots of different ways that it's happening and lots of different initiatives. The initiative I want to talk about today, or I've been involved in, is something called the European Open Science Cloud. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on what it actually is because we'll soon get very, very bogged down. Uh, but if you I like to think about what it does. It's trying to create a sort of seamless environment for researchers, and that's researchers in the broadest sense. So it could be citizen scientists, it could be education um, practitioners who, who do research, all sorts of different types of researchers, to share their data, to reuse it and resources, um, and software and services. I like to think of it as it's almost like the web, but for, for sort of data and, and research. So in, in the past, it was difficult to exchange information in different formats, use different services, whereas now it's a lot easier because you just do it all through a web browser. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're aiming for here. Um, there's a lot of problems with implementing this, which is again a whole other talk um, in terms of the technical sides, the financial, the political, the cultural issues. You've got to get researchers to share their data in the first place. Uh, but I'm here to talk about the skills side of things. It's a changing culture, but it's also that there is a skills gap there. Um, and this report um, highlighted at least half a million data scientists are now needed. So that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, today and various collaborations that are working to address the skills gap. Just to recap EOSC Synergy, as I said, I was here two years ago, or not here, uh, because two years ago was the first um, OER that went online. So we abruptly went online and I presented under the uh, theme of open infrastructure on the EOSC Synergy project. So um, what we aim to do, it's a, it's a regional EOSC project, we aim to, to bring the whole idea and the infrastructure around EOSC and embed it within our national infrastructures in the different consortium countries. So we do have um, various different strands, we're developing services, um, we're developing the infrastructure and then we're also doing training as well. And you can see we did actually contribute to the, the COVID-19 data sharing um, initiatives as well. So, um, in terms of the services, if you're interested in what we're doing with the services of researchers, they focus on four key areas. So, we're looking at um, environment, environmental astrophysics, and uh, earth observation. Um, so, some of these do cover some of the great sort of global challenges that we're facing around climate change and um, you know, illnesses, etc. So, please do have a look at some of our services, but that's not what we're here to, to think about today. We're here to think about the, the training uh, that we did. And in terms of that training, we were focused on infrastructure. One strand of our work was to build an, an online platform, another online platform, um, but we did try to focus on uh, the needs of open science. So we have a suite of tools and there, things like Jupyter Notebooks, and um, we've developed a hackathon as a service platform, and all of this is sort of openly available. We also created, uh, and, and are in the process of creating a set of resources around our services and subjects, my, my role was really around supporting best practice when we were creating, creating these materials, how to use the online environment to deliver um, training in the best way we could. Because we were always about online training, even before COVID. Um, and then now we're sort of working with institutions to try and embed um, what we're doing. So we're, we're focusing on sort of three areas, platforms and technology, the good practice and training, and then also the sustainability and the embedding, um, making open science the norm, I guess. And to do that, we've worked in collaboration with quite a, a lot of people um, over the last two years, and that's, that's really what I want to, to focus on. Um, I will be talking about different examples um, of the problems that we faced, but I really want to focus on the people that, that I've been involved with. So just to take you back to September 2019, this was our kickoff meeting in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. 
and this is the um, University of uh, Santiago de Compostela, and that's the Faculty of Chemistry, which is where it was being hosted, the kickoff meeting. I don't know, you probably can't quite see, but that's actually a, a, a balcony, a terrace there. You can see people on there. And the buffet for this event was just inside the doors there. And I was stood because this, con this conference was being co-located with a very technical computer conference. And I was really fish out of water there, stood on my own, in a new community, not knowing anybody at all. Um, but thankfully, this person came up and started talking to me. This is um, Ellen Leonard. She works for Dance, a Dutch uh, networking uh, data service. And she um, immediately was a kind of kindred spirit. And she um, introduced me to a lot of the networks that um, I've subsequently become involved with. Um, Ellen has actually a background in commercial online learning. She worked for BT, but she moved into to open training and, and finds, obviously, like most of us, that it's so valuable, that sharing and being able to work with inspiring people and, and put your own teams together in, in a kind of flexible and open sort of way. So Ellen, one of the things Ellen introduced me to was um, the Open Science Community of Practice of Training Coordinators. She was actually one of the, the founding members of this uh, particular community. So this has played a key role in building the networks. Um, it was set up by an organisation called Open Air um, in 2018, and Ellen and Arena, who I'll talk about in a moment, uh, were both founding members. So it currently has over 100 members in over 20 countries. And we get together every month, and we just we share practice, we talk about some, some aspect of our research or, or our practice. Um, and then we also have the second half of the meeting is where we actually work on our collaborations, the projects. The, the problems that we've identified. So we're working on things at the moment, looking at um, specifically gathering good practice on um, teaching open science online, and um, how can we make our training materials fair, which I'll come back to um, in a moment. But that um, community of practice, as I say, it's, it's hugely valuable, and Irina is a real key figure um, in that community of practice. She was one of the founders, and Irina works for um, an organization called IFL, which is Electronic um, Information for Libraries. And again, it's, a, it's, a national, it's an international organisation that supports various different countries around the world in um, access to content and also supporting public library innovation. So that's very much um, her background. Um, she actually leads um, open science projects in um, Africa and in Europe, in places like uh, Congo, Lesotho, Uganda. So she she's really is um, working globally and she's absolutely amazing person. I'm never, wherever I go in open science, Irina is there. And I don't know how she manages to have the time and keep such a cool, calm head, because she's always, as I said, very reflected, and um, you can rely upon Irina. Um, now, Irina, I've noticed I've put orchids for everybody. I've got to be open, so if you want to track people down, then everybody's orchid um, IDs um, are there. So, Irina is, as I said, one of the key figures that, that I've met over the last few years. Uh, that quote on the slide there, which kind of um, introduces the, the community, that, uh, that's come from a survey that we did, and it was actually a lady called Celia who, who um, gave that quote. Celia um, works for um, what's called a research infrastructure. Her background's in life sciences and biomedical sciences. She, she's a training officer. And uh, she, again, she's Dutch. There's a lot of open science work being led um, in the Netherlands. Uh, but Celia uh, works for, um, as well as her, her home institution, she works for Elixir. And again, I, I'm aware that there's a lot of jargon. Elixir is what's called a, a research infrastructure. So they do provide technical infrastructure, uh, but they're very discipline specific. So they really focus on the needs of their researchers. Um, and Elixir, as I mentioned, is life sciences. And um, one of the activities that we became involved in um, through Celia um, is the idea of making training materials fair. So I've talked about fair principles applying to data. Uh, there's now an increasing community looking at, can you apply these same, same principles to training materials? And um, a couple of years ago, the, the Elixir group came up with this, this um, article called 10 Simple Rules for Making Your Training Materials Fair. Now, obviously, the idea of reuse and reuse is, is an age-old problem in the OER community. So I'd be interested to see what you think of, of this approach, so please do, do look at the, the references and give us your feedback. But they take you through these 10 steps and 
talking about things like giving it a unique identity, having a DOI so it can be tracked and it can be cited, um, registering it in a, in a place where it can be discovered, adding the right metadata. So as I say, this is a really sort of interesting development and um, we're carrying on working on this and we tried to apply these rules within Synergy when we made our own materials um, available publicly. Um, so again, please, I would really, really value your input there. And Celia, I asked her what, why she values collaboration. She said, well, typically from a life scientist, it's in the DNA of trainers. It's, it's in our DNA to share, to collaborate. Um, just to follow up on the, the metadata side of things, again, within our project, EOS Synergy, we wanted people to find our resources. So how do we do that? Well, one of those ways is to improve the metadata to enable it to be discovered um, better. And again, there are, this is not new to the OER community, but there are initiatives now, in, uh, more coming from the open science community, around um, metadata for training resources. The Research Data Alliance has an interest group with an extremely long and complicated name, so I won't attempt to, to say that, but what they've done recently is come up with um, a set of minimal metadata requirements. So, you know, it's not just about the old words. What, what do you need to be able to discover um, educational resources? And I should say that there is a bit of crossover. They obviously have looked at existing standards. Um, but again, it'd be interesting to see the perspectives of the OER community on this, this work as well. And through this uh, particular initiative, I came to know um, Elizabeth Newbold. Um, somebody as already knows her. And Elizabeth um, is, is based in the UK. She actually works for a funding council. So we've got librarians, we've got researchers, we've got um, data um, sort of officers, and we've got funding councils, all part of this, this work. And Elizabeth, um, actually, when I met her, I was thinking, she's very, very familiar. I know the name, I know the name. And then I did a bit of Google um, and LinkedIn stalking. Realized we actually went to university together uh, and did our information studies uh, masters together. Now, obviously, Elizabeth is uh, making a lot more use of her information skills than, than I am currently. I, I, I shifted over into the training delivery. Um, but Elizabeth's very involved in, in this idea of FAIR and how we roll this out to institutions. And she's been um, involved in um, a project called FAIR's FAIR. And FAIR's FAIR is another um, Horizon Europe and EOS, EOS project. But it really is all about um, well, it's a fostering FAIR data practices in Europe. So it's using these principles to underpin sharing of data, but as you can see, it's already being applied to, to other um, sort of areas. So we got involved um, with Fair's Fair in training around data stewards. Now, the whole idea of, of open science, I mentioned there's a skills gap, so new roles are emerging, and data steward is one of them. Because the idea of expecting researchers, every researcher to have the in-depth data skills to be able to manage this for themselves, is quite unrealistic, so we need intermediaries, we need new types of intermediary, and data students are, are one of those. So we started to, to run training. Um, Synergy got involved. Well, supporting data students is not a key role of Synergy, but our um, material around pedagogy um, was, was useful here because that's a key role of data students, is actually training um, others. So we worked with Fair's Fair, we ran some training, um, and you can see the stats, and again it was from a, a wide range of different countries. And then at the end we also converted that training course into an online open educational resource, which is hosted on our Synergy Learn platform. So that's a very concrete output. And through uh, Fair's Fair, I, I met Hugh. Now Hugh is, um, Hugh Shan Shanahan works for Royal Holloway, uh, University of London, and he's a professor of open science. Um, his background, again, is bioinformatics, and the reason he got into open was because bioinformatics is all about good data and good code, and he felt that the environment he was working in was one of, about what he called hit-and-run research, so the idea was all about getting something published, getting it past the reviewers, that was the important part, not actually about whether it was good data and code in the first place, but that's how he ended up in um, open science. Um, moving on to sort of one of the last areas that, that we worked in, uh, which was around that sort of national approach to openness and, and embedding. Um, Synergy is made up of nine different countries. I happen to be from the UK, so I've been looking at how can we join up um, our EOSC Synergy activities with UK initiatives. 
And the two initiatives that we, we kind of joined up with, the first is the, the Open Research Competency Coalition, or ORC, as I will now call it. Um, this is a, a sort of an informal grouping of many of the major um, organisations and institutions involved in supporting uh, open science um, sort of, uh, roles. So librarians, research managers um, and others, researcher developers, all the people that have to support their institutions. Um, it's about, well, they also have skills requirements. They need to know how to teach in these subjects. They firstly need the skills before they can teach other people. So we find that there's a skills gap there. There are new roles emerging and there's no training uh, for these roles. So that's the sort of the questions that we were uh, exploring. And Danny uh, was one of the uh, founders of that group. Um, in fact, she is now, she's an Australian, she's now based back in Australia, but at the time she was um, leading the scholarly communications and research um, section in Cambridge University Library. And she was training up her staff in these new roles and then they were getting poached by other institutions. So she's having to train up more people. So we were looking at how can we professionalize this and make them more roots into these careers. Um, Valerie joined, Valerie is the University of Glasgow. Now she's coming from a very different perspective. She's coming from a research management perspective. Um, she works um, tirelessly. She is incredibly community driven. She runs um, her professional bodies, open, um, interest, open access interest group. She runs Open Research Scotland as well, so she's always out there um, trying to, to, to sort of promote community exchange. And, um, oh, I've gone the wrong way. Evara really does throw herself into things, so she takes any opportunity to dress up if she wants to. So we were doing a workshop, she'd be dressed as a, as a worker. And she made me put this picture in. Oh. She recently got an award um, from her professional body for the work that she does. Uh, presented by Anton Dubeck. So Valerie, um, as I say, is another person that is tirelessly committed to this in her part of the open science uh, world. Uh, the final um, sort of thing I want to talk about in terms of the UK is the UK Reproducibility Network. And this is quite significant. Um, I should say that we all, everybody involved on this, on this slide with Org, Synergy, and UK around, we actually joined forces with Fair's Fair to run a workshop just before Christmas to explore the skills gap in the UK around open science. So what are institutions currently doing? And also what are, the, what, what are institutions doing to support the staff that are training others in open research? And we work together with the UK Reproducibility Network. Now they, again, are coming at, at open science from a different angle. Similar to Hugh, it's all about good data, good code, and being able to reproduce science so it's, it's better quality and the reason I'm mentioning this, I mentioned Marcus who is uh, one of the founders of the UKRN, they've recently got quite a significant amount of funding from Research England to run an open research program and what they're doing with the UKRN is building up a UK wide network um, and they're having a, a train the trainer approach so they want to train their local networks within UK universities and who will then train others and their, their interpretation of open is quite broad so they are looking at right from ethics through to um, you know some, some quite practical um, data skills and I'm quite interested I say I think that could be an opportunity to bridge gaps with open education we're looking at open practices Catherine I couldn't help but up here you're looking at open practices in Ireland and I think it'd be interesting to see how far they, they do mix with the open science practice. I know there's a lot of open research work going on in Ireland as well. Um, so I won't say too much about the last two initiatives because I'm running out of time because I thought I would, but um, these are global communities. So I've talked about different regional communities. Um, we got involved in REPO, which uh, reimagining re educational practice for open, which is a truly global um, project. It's been led by Daniel Paul O'Donnell, um, who is a, an English professor in the University of Lethbridge in Canada. Um, and that project was particularly exploring the impact of COVID on open science training and open science communities. Um, and it will be producing some outputs. We, we've had fireside chats, we've had events. Uh, we tried to run a survey, but everybody was too exhausted to fill our survey in. Um, so we're busy trying to, to pull the outputs together. But essentially what that's done is try to bring together all of the global communities 
so we can we can learn from from each other. And I'm going to give an honourable mention to Flavio as Vedo, um, partly because I've only just got to know Flavio um, through the UKRN, and um, I came across this initiative before, which I was thinking, wow, that's just amazing. It's generally run by early career researchers, and they're really looking at how to embed open research and responsibly producible uh, research into curriculums within universities. So it's another whole different world, and they're taking a very different approach to the approach that's coming from the sort of open data world. Um, and also Flavio is presenting here on Friday, uh, sorry, on Thursday. So please do look out for his presentation on the report. So I've come from that balcony in Santiago, where I didn't know anybody two years ago, to being part of this incredibly vibrant uh, community of extremely committed um, professionals. And as you can see, they're professionals from all different parts of the open science, open research world, um, from research managers, researchers, funders. Um, so I think and they're from different disciplines, different roles. Um, and I think that's what's really important. And I think what brings us together, lost my page, lost my notes, sorry. Last page is the, um, that's my last page, no? please forgive me. There we go. What brings us is our shared values. It's the shared values that we have. Coming back to the beginning, that's what brings us together, and it's the commitment that we have. Um, one thing I didn't mention about Irina when I talked about her earlier is that she's from the Ukraine. Um, and obviously, uh, we know what's been happening there. But Irina kept going, kept attending meetings. She disappeared from meetings. Oh, I've just got to go down to the basement. Um, there's, a, there's a siren's just gone off. She disappeared for three days and then she was back at meetings. And that, in that time, they'd traveled from just outside Kiev, where, where she lived, through Poland to Lithuania. And she kept coming back. She's absolutely phenomenal. But within a couple of weeks, she was writing about the impact of libraries and that what they were having in, um, in Ukraine. So these are the people that we're, they're working with. They're just amazing, amazing people. And um, something that Ellen said when I was talking to her about it, she said, well, Ellen is about to leave. She's, she's about leaving her role and she's moving in. She said, well, I sort of see it as a wave. I was the latest wave in the contribution to open science in Europe, and there'll be more coming along. Um, so I think that's a nice, nice image as well, that we're all part of this um, environment. But to finish with some of my reflections um, on the communities, I think one thing that really strikes me is that while we're all very open and we want to share, there are a lot of different communities out there, and how do you learn from each other. Can you ever prevent that you know, infamous re reinventing the wheel? I'm not sure you can, so how do we minimise it? And perhaps there is actually value a lot of the time in that contextualisation, and etc. But um, it, is, it is quite a difficult thing, even if you try, you know, my background is in libraries, you could do a really, really thorough literature search, but would you have found that, that journal article on 10 simple rules in PLOS computational biology? I'm not sure that average educational researcher might have found that. So there are some serious differences in communities there, but I do think that it's worth, obviously, us um, really trying to bridge those gaps. And that's why I'm here today, that's why Flavio's here, that's why I think there's a really interesting looking session on Wednesday about bridging synergies between open science and open education. Um, in terms of the collaborations, yeah, I think collaborations they can be slow, I'm sure you know, and they can be exhausting. And one thing I think you've got to be aware of is that they do attract, open work I think in practice attaches, attracts certain types of people um, who are very committed and I think there has to be a duty of care that employers really to get, look out for those people that they don't overextend. Um, but I do find it really, really exhilarating and it gives me hope. If anybody um, caught Audrey Watcher's keynote at Digifest, if you didn't, I won't attempt to capture what, what she covered, but there was a lot about hope and what I was thinking about when I was listening was the hope that I feel when I'm part of this open science community. Um, so I think that's, that's where I'm going to finish. I've probably forgotten lots of really key things to say, but I know we're out of time. Um, actually, I'm going to finish with this, which is Isabel, who is the project manager for um, EOS Synergy. And this is a personal email that she sent to me, and I, I did get permission to reproduce this. But it's something that I keep going back to. The date on that is very significant. Uh, 31st of January 2020, when the UK left the EU. And the message that she sent there was, was a really one of hope for me. You know, it really did um, reassure me that, that, you know, we're doing things for the right reason. We're here to collaborate, and that's what's important. 
and a little plug there for the Stick to the Science campaign, which is trying to keep politics out of the public science. So thank you. And, <laughs> and a little thanks to Chris Thompson, who tried to help me embed some storytelling through that. <laughs> so, thank you very much. That's been great.